Sound Notion. Sound Notion. Sound Notion. Awesome. This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Sam Mercier's. I'm Nate Blyton. And I'm Dave McDonald. We don't have a guest this week. We're sorry. We had <laughs> we were gonna have a guest, but then our guest had to reschedule, and we'll have that guest again later. Um, these things happen. It's show these, business, people. It's right. I'm and, not sorry. And you know what I learned about show business from watching television is that the show must go on. Yeah. Barely. Man, every time we don't have a guest, it seems like we can barely manage to get through the opening like intro thing. <laughs> what are you trying like, to say? I think I think we're very professional right now. This is this what's going on right now? We are broadcast <laughs> professionals. That's, that's our right. banter. This is yes, this is banter. We're like this like is why drive they come. time radio. Exactly. <laughs> this is this is why they come. It's the personalities that draw you in. This and when I say make... you, I mean the people that are watching and listening to this show, right? Am I right? You're right. I'm right. And when you're right, you're right. And we, and you, you're right. Uh, so, uh, what we, we talk about? Uh, let's talk about the Grammys. You know, right. let's talk about the Grammys. So, uh, last year we talked about the Grammys, and we had some some. Um, News would not necessarily be the right word, but there were some new things to talk about with the structure of the Grammys. They got rid of a bunch of categories. They the decided slash. there's there's way too many Grammys going out, and, and they wanted to deal with Grammy inflation, which was a rampant problem. And so they cut back on the production of new Grammys. Um, and a lot of the Grammy Awards categories that they got rid of were in classical music, and they got rid of um, some folk categories as well, if I recall. Um, and I guess they felt like they had gone a little bit too far, and so the pendulum swung back just a little bit this year, and they've added a couple of new categories, um, and those nominations were, were just announced this week. Um, the ones that we probably care and that our audience probably cares the most about are the, the nominations for um, Best New Composition. Who's got those, those nominees pulled up? Best Contemporary Classical Composition. Um, incident, incidental music to imaginary puppet plays by Stephen Hartkey. 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 Um, performed by Eighth Blackbird. Um, nice. And they capitalized E and B in Eighth Blackbird. That's a faux pas. Mm. Rah, rah, rah. Oh, yeah. right. I don't think they really care. <laughs> I'm just saying. But Dave, I, mean, I think that's just a graphic care. design thing. You can write it however you want. In Nura for voices, strings, and percussion. Is that right? Yeah, Tanya mm -hmm. Leon. Mm -hmm. We talked about her on the show before, yeah. didn't we? The Nightingale, which is... Yugis Prolins. Danish, Danish National Vocal Ensemble, so that's some sort of choir piece. Uh, this... Cello Concerto Number 2. By Radavara. Helsinki Philharmonic. What is his name? Is it Ratavara? Ratavara. Radavara. And, and this is Spucky. the most. Yeah, this is August 4, 1964. Well, so we'll we'll be listening to those in the in the near future uh, on the show. But the thing that I think is really interesting is this new category, which if somebody can explain to me, I will give you fifty dollars right now. <laughs> I'm so I will give you fifty dollars if you can explain to me what best classical compendium is and i will even help you by reading what the grammy uh what the recording academy says about this category best classical compendium category is for an album collection containing at least 51 percent playing time of newly recorded material of performances paren vocal or instrumental by various soloists and or ensembles involving a mixture of classical subgenres Albums entered here may, be, may not be entered in other classical album categories, but tracks from these albums may potentially be entered in other classical categories. 
Certain classical crossover albums may also be eligible here. <laughs> what does that mean? The Apparently. best album that somebody managed to put the label classical on. Right. Somehow. Apparently, apparently, the best classical album was a little bit too constraining of a category. <laughs> so, I know because there still is a best classical album. <laughs> right. and this is yeah. like something else. It's it, it it has so I think it's the thing that I would emphasize that this description probably it, it could be written to emphasize better is uh, the mixture of classical subgenres. Whatever classical subgenres are, I don't know if they're talking about like time periods. If they're, I mean, if Baroque, does, I don't think of Baroque as a subgenre of anything, but whatever. Yeah. Um, well, see, it's interesting that 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 category is described that way. But the first list is uh, Parch, which is like the Parch ensemble, you know, bitter music. So. It's, you know, whatever this group produced, I saw them pr play live in New Mexico, and whatever it is, I'm, I bet you it's interesting to listen to. <laughs> yeah, very, very I mean, if, any, if anybody deserves an award, it's, it's the Harry Parch crowd, <laughs> right? Just, um, but know, I don't understand, so, like, what, what is being mixed there? I don't know. Like, that but seems like a pretty homogenous thing. It, ob it obviously includes a lot of, it's, it's, they've engineered it so they can just take things they want to put in there. I guess because like I'm, the second one is a pender. Uh, pe how do you say it? Penderecki. Uh, Patrick. I would know. Pa Patrick just gets all crazy with the pronouncing the his what? this name. What? What? Penderecki. What? Penderecki. Shushtoff Penderecki. There we go. Shushtoff. Oh, you were going for the first name. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, th and that's another one. Like, what classical subgenre? Maybe, maybe, maybe this would be clear if we actually like had the disc in our hands, but. Yeah, the titles do not make them sound like they are very uh, com compendian. I'm it sounds it, when when you make first up said that, that word. when we were first talking about this, it sounded like it was going to be like the fifty best classical recordings you have to hear before you die or something. Right, the Fifty Shades of Grey disc. Right, right. Well, not just fifty. I, I guess it could be it could be the Fifty Shades of Grey disc, which I'm okay, sure think... should be on there. <laughs> I think I'm starting to get what this is about. Okay. What do you got? I think this is like an archival award. Seriously. No, but it's 50% newly recorded stuff. Well, that's or how they're 51 saying. 51%, the, the, which the is Mash dumb Bill. because what they clearly mean is a majority, so they should say 50% plus one second or something, but they the, say 51, which is dumb. The MASH bill has to be at least 51% new material. Well, no. So maybe maybe you're right, Sam. They they say newly recorded material, but that doesn't necessarily mean new newly compositions, created, right? Yeah. Right. So like, so, so maybe it is new archives of old material. Harry Parts wrote a lot of crazy stuff that has <laughs> probably not been recorded, you know. Yeah. So like, if someone comes out with a like the Bernstein Beethoven out or compendium, that would be something like that. Yeah, new. You know, recorded. will they let you say it? You know, uh. A, a, uh, could you have, for as an example, an album of pieces that are like war horses, but they're all conducted by women? Would that fit the compendium category that they're talking about yeah, here? But, I don't well, know, is who, conducted who, by women a, a, a subgenre of classical music? Well, the thing, the <laughs> well, like, they're, they're that's the thing that I don't as understand. Loose as possible. No, no. The issue would be for something like that is who do you give the award to? Well, the award, it doesn't matter who you give the, like, the award is given to an album, and how the people involved in making that album deal with receiving that award, I would assume is up to the record label that produced the record, but it, that, like, that's a, that's a different, that's a different conundrum. I just don't understand what music they're putting in this group. Uh, especially when I read the description and it makes me think one thing, and then I look at the list of nominees, and that's a completely different idea to me. I, d I just don't understand. Like, ugh. If, if you know what's going on here, if you're from the Recording Academy and watching this show for reasons passing understanding, please drop us a line and let us know what the heck is going on here because it sounds like somebody at the Recording Academy has no idea what they're talking about. And I know that that is probably inconceivable to inconceivable. Inconceivable. I was. I'm. All That's three funny. of you went for that. <laughs> it's like it's like shooting fish in a barrel here. 
That's right. I was the only person who used the appropriate accent, though. <laughs> I think you got the lisp, lisp perfectly. <laughs> yeah, I think right. I think you did the best all impression. Right. Was there? All right. So, Stephen, sorry about this. I think it's an archival this. award. People right. who are going out there and getting stuff recorded that you know needs to be archived. I think that's what they're. I think that's what they're giving acknowledging. Yeah, Naxos project. Well, that's my theory. Sam, you mentioned uh, another a, a non-classical composition in in the part that we that we cut out when I screwed up <laughs> when 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 you started reading the wrong list, which I cut out. Yeah. Um, Mozart goes dancing. You met well. You mentioned a, a piece uh, by uh, Dave Brubeck and his son Chris. Yeah. And uh, if if you haven't heard, I don't mean to take everybody down from Princess Bride, but. Uh, Dave Brubeck passed away this week at the age of 91. A day short of his 92nd birthday. A, a day short. Um, so it's, it's very, <laughs> it was a very sad day for uh, a lot of composers and a lot of musicians in general. Dave Brubeck, um, Sam, I think you had a, you had a good tweet about this, but, uh, you, Dave Brubeck taught us all that, um, you can, you can be pretty cool in strange meters. Right. Yeah. You said you said Dave Brubeck taught you to swing in five. Well, taught me to try to swing in five. Right. <laughs> well, and and we should. One thing that's bugged me about this coverage, take five was written by Paul Desmond. It was not written by yep. Dave Brubeck. Right. <laughs> it was written by the saxophone player. Dave Brubeck wrote a lot of great stuff. Uh, I listened to Kathy's Waltz this week, which is on that um, the uh, timeout disc, but. Uh, So that was Blue Rondo a la Turk. Yeah, that would have been a great choice. Yes. To pound into the ground instead of <laughs> take five. So does anybody have any, any Dave Brubeck remembrances they'd like to share? I don't know if I have any remembrances. Sam's a played... saxophone player, so I know Sam like oh. had this uh, take five epiphany hearing Paul Desmond play. Well, it's, it's the same kind of uh, epiphany... Um, I, I, expe- I would say that Coltrane's solo on site is song flute, where he's just doing parallel adja- uh, chromatically adjacent chords, but the way he does it makes it sound so natural. And then hearing Paul Desmond play in five and the way his phrasing falls out in five, those sensations were very similar. Like, that is so simple, but like I don't think I could have come up with that. <laughs> you know, right. I'm just, whatever, he's got a gear for improvising that I don't. Um and and one of the things that's remarkable about the the that group playing that music is that if you're if you're you know not paying attention to what you're listening to, especially if you're not a trained musician, you you wouldn't notice that anything was weird about it because they they like you say they groove really hard. That it feels so comfortable, yep. um, and it's not like the music involves all this weird meter stuff, but it's not about the weird meter stuff. Yeah, um, like a lot of but music that came about- after it was about knowing how to swing even though it is in a weird meter right and you know of course like people like chris potter and you know uh chick curry and all kinds of people have done all kinds of crazy meter things now but you know to see a group just get up and manage to swing that hard in five at that time was strange that was uh you know a much bigger right. deal than you know every uh jazz major or every every saxophone player in college has tried to you know put together a little group and, and play it's, that it's song that's a pretty i mean that's night i think that first recording is 1959 yeah um so they were they were early, so early to there the are some party. serious horn-rimmed glasses going on oh man were there ever <laughs> some horn-rimmed glasses <laughs> my awesome. dad was in another hip. sorry go those ahead. are called those are called birth control glasses <laughs> I don't not, think not, that's how they were thought of in the not, 1950s. Not in well, probably not. My my dad said that in the Navy that's what they call them because if you don't have your own glasses, then you're issued your birth control glasses. <laughs> so uh, so what's our next news item here? Well, so we in addition to uh, Dave Brubeck, we also lost British composer uh, Jonathan Harvey this week, um, and he is. We were talking about this before the show. One of these great European composers that often gets overlooked in the U S. Um, so there've been a number of, uh, remembrances of Jonathan Harvey around the web that, uh, link to recordings of his music. And we'll, we'll link to some of those. Uh, if you're, if you're in the U S like us and less familiar with Jonathan Harvey than people in the UK might be, he's a British composer. Um, 
You should absolutely and, uh, follow up on, on those and listen to some of his stuff. What were you going to say, Sam? I listened to uh, quite a big chunk of his music this morning because I've never heard of the guy. I'll admit it. And, you know, I w- it made me wonder if he ever said to himself, what do I got to do to get an American to listen to my music? <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, it was it was pass away. But mission accomplished. Wow, that was really dark, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, took it, you took it somewhere really dark all of a sudden. Look at that was like so much metaphor in that <laughs> that two minutes. Oh man. I was thinking about Ricardo Lorenz, Dave. Yeah. Our, our one of our teachers in graduate school used to say that that was one of the things that you had to do to uh to be a famous composer was to die. So the death. Sam, you you do you brought everything down. All right. Uh speaking of bringing everything down. <laughs> really? <laughs> Life string <laughs> tracks. <laughs> I'm I'm totally screwing up with the screwing around with the order because I don't want to, uh, right. I don't know. The the Leistungsschutzrecht <laughs> is a, a law being uh, debated in Germany right now that Sam added to the doc because he thinks it's really important for all of you to know it. Um, but it is it is a law that would prevent uh, quoting and linking to content on the internet without paying the content creators so any content any content so why is this important as an example let's imagine you've got a bunch of uh songs on soundcloud yes tell me sam why you want them to you know most people aren't gonna make a lot of money with having stuff on that's not what their goal is to spread their music or whatever and the ability for you to get that spread out to people would be seriously seriously like i wouldn't say hindered it would be nullified almost in in a situation where somebody would be having to pay licensing fees to soundcloud in order just to quote you know the name of the song or describe it in any way and put a link to your content so those are the kinds of things that are at stake so that's why i wanted to at least mention it and and dave has informed me this law has been floating around there a while and uh, somebody that dave introduced me to jeff jarvis tweeted this with the annotation that it's a really good english explanation so he thought it was worth mentioning that, you know, for people who don't speak German, this is a good way to figure out what's going on. Because, you know, if a legislation in German, if, a, if legislators in Germany are considering it, it doesn't mean, you know, it could end up here as well. Well, that's so, one of the problems with the Internet is that it's do, it doesn't, it has, it has no borders. It doesn't obey political boundaries that we have as a 6.7 billion of us decided we care about. Um, so it's. It when even a small-ish country like Germany, though a considerably more powerful country than a lot of others, a small country decides that they want to make this law about the internet. It it has the potential to have a dramatic effect on everyone in the whole world. Uh, yes, Germans are notoriously uh, crazy about privacy and things like that on the internet, and this is kind of just a part of that. Uh, and. Uh, I think that's enough to say about the Leistungsschutzrecht. If you're curious, you'll click the link and read about it. And if you're not, I'm sorry for the last three minutes of our show. Um, Speaking of the internet, there are some very innovative things happening on the internet right now. We read this week about um, a choir rehearsing on the internet. And if that sounds crazy to you, it It sounds crazy to us too. And it's, it's, it's totally crazy bananas. Um, (laughs) This is a, a distance learning program in the state of Ohio. Is that right? Yeah, um, it's it, the NPR article doesn't make it really explicitly clear, but um, uh, it's the the Ohio Distance and Electronic Learning Academy, which is just well, you know a like they have lots of these all over the country. You know, it's an online or virtual uh, K twelve uh, education program, um, and you know. That's not – the fact that that exists is no big deal. Those exist everywhere. It's the fact that one of the teachers has taken on teaching a choir using the same kinds of tools that they use. They say some kind of virtual chat or something like that. So some sort of you know, uh, you know, telepresence kind of thing where there's audio and video is what they use to have uh, online rehearsal sessions that are then backed up, they say, with at least one um, – in-person lesson per quarter or semester yeah, or whatever they have, they their have academic a quarterly uh, live in-person rehearsal is what it yeah, said. Yeah, and 
What's exciting is this. Okay, so that's the program generally. The choir is in uh, well, somewhere in Ohio, so it's pretty close to me. And uh, they had their first live performance as a result of this program last night. Awesome. And so I was looking around on YouTube and couldn't find anything. So if anybody knows anyone who's associated with this in any way, encourage them. And, you know, I guess I could email whoever and to get them up on YouTube because I'd really like to see it. So now the four of us uh, live hundreds of miles apart and, and we have the Internet uh, so you guys like want to start a barbershop quartet or something? <laughs> oh sure. <laughs> Sound notion. Sound notion. Sound notion. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I had Never to go first because I wouldn't effort. have been able to find my pitch. <laughs> it was a little weird over Skype, but I think it worked. Um, <laughs> and I should have gone. Sound notion. Sorry, guys. We're, we're right. <laughs> we made it. Um, so one of the things, this actually is very similar to a story we talked about last week on the show, um, where two country artists, one of them in Los Angeles and one of them in Sam's hometown of Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, Mm. were collaborating in a live performance. So they were, the, the, the concert was set up in Chattanooga and the guy in LA was joining via a video chat system. Um, this article that we talked about don't, doesn't say what video chat service was being used to make this work uh and i don't think that really matters but the tricky thing is latency like what what we just did singing would not have worked if we were trying to like sing in time it worked because we were all spread out and kind of just like holding and you know out of time um and there are the, good services that do accommodate for that though uh like internet are, too so th- Internet 2 tries to accommodate for that. I'm not convinced that it actually well, does like, a good um, enough job. The whole, there's a huge video conferencing um, video lesson program set up at the Manhattan School of Music that has been really successful since the 90s, I believe. Um, I do know that um, Pincus Zuckerman does occasionally teach lessons through that and a number of other professors as well. So, I mean, it must it must work at some level, but I've never actually seen it in... well. In, the big difference here is, I mean, do they do ensemble instruction through that system? I think that's I doubt, what they're saying. I, I think that's what they're saying they try to do. I, I think it's, I, well, I mean, it's just lessons? manageable for private lessons. Yeah, yeah, for private lessons, I mean, we've talked about that. We featured that service that was like, had, uh, you know, shelled out to get some top symphony pros. Mm-hmm. And, you know, was set, billing the service that way. But that's, and that was more like... I don't remember, but that was more like you make a video and they review it kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, it was it was very asynchronous. Um, and yeah. this seems so the, to be the key here live. is like it's a whole bunch of people. It's doing what you know. It's choir rehearsal, sound notion style. Right. And um, and I know, think that's what we call that type of rehearsal is sound notion style. Sound that's notion a technical style. term. I, I'm seeing a Gangnam like, style, like gang- sound notion style Gangnam remix. Open Gangnam style. Um. So I don't know. This is a cool thing, but. We're gonna need if 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 something like this is gonna take off and be viable, um, it seems like we in the United States and the rest of the world, but especially in the United States, uh, are gonna need a lot faster connection speeds and a lot lower latency. We try to we try to think before the show where we all tried to clap together in time and we failed miserably. I think we should um, demonstrate that as well. Yeah, yeah let's try that again. So here's what this is. Go- I'm gonna I'm gonna count off and we're all gonna try to just clap the beat, and it's not gonna work. I, I promise. Ready? One, two, three, four. See how that didn't work at all? <laughs> That's how it would be trying to play music with these guys, even if right. you were in the same room because they have no sense of time, but especially over the internet. Hey! Hey! Um, hey, hey Copernicus. Hey! So... <laughs> Uh, there, there's a lot of things to work out, um, and we don't have a lot of easy solutions to it. Um, the, again, this doesn't say what they were using. Clearly we're using Skype and that could introduce any number of its own craziness into the scenario, but we just need to move to Kansas city. Well, yeah, there we go. We'll move to Kansas city together and we'll live in a big mansion like the monkeys. Um, and, and. And hey, hey, we're sound notion. No, they need to team up Kansas City and Chattanooga, Tennessee. Need to team up and make the Kansas City Chattanooga Power Choir. 
Right. Where they, they always rehearse together on through their fiber connections. That's right. That's, that sounds completely reasonable to me, Sam. Um, so anyway, uh, getting things fast enough to have real-time video interface, that's the big thing. Right. And, and are we, we do that. How far away is that? Uh, Dave knows all those things. To, it's, it's, it's not happening anytime soon because your local cable company has... Uh, in, in 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 except for rare circumstances, has a complete monopoly and therefore no incentive to upgrade any of their internet connections. And the way technology seems to progress in the United States is like squeaking it out at whatever rate maximizes the the re up uh, money they get from people upgrading in those tiny increments over and over and over and over again. But it, it, of in in a ranking of average connection speeds for homes the united states ranks in like the 30s in the world mm -hmm. uh but we pay in the top five or ten yeah so uh we we pay a lot f for not very much in the u.s right. so again that's because welcome the, to that's america because the telecom monopolies local local monopolies obviously they you're gonna have to, it's pick time the to move on we're, we're getting way out into the weeds let's talk about some music eh I could try and execute a transition if you hadn't completely screwed the order up, Dave. Well, you know what? I didn't. <sighs> I was trying to be thoughtful and treat uh, Mr. Brubeck and Harvey with the respect that they deserve. By clapping. All right. So there's stuff going on with Spotify, and Dave knows everything about Spotify I, and the internet. I, I, that's right. I know everything there is to know about pretty much everything so uh, and dave's a loyal spotify user so allow me to explain it at you uh <laughs> at you spotify hey, if you're after. not familiar is a music streaming service uh you can use it for free or you can pay a small fee to use it without ads and on your mobile device um they are uh, rolling out some new features soon and uh, their ceo daniel Eck had a sit down with Stuart dredge of the guardian this week uh spotify is originally from the uk and we only had had it in the us for a couple of years now um it's, i think it's been in the uk since like 2008 or so um but they're they're rolling out some new features based on some of the usage statistics they have uh and one of the things that they're trying to solve and that a lot of services are trying to solve is discovery. How do you find new music that you have not heard before, but that you would like if you did hear it? Um, and there are a lot of ways to do that. The The most common uh, or the, the most popular service that is as good as anyone else at it is Pandora, where you kind of give thumbs up and thumbs down to each track. And it tries to help you figure out, um, you know, what new things you might like to listen to. So Spotify now, is, or sorry, go ahead. Let me let me ask you a question. Ax it. All right. Now, when you say I like something or I don't like something, what will uh, are the are there algorithms uh, algorithms that determine like specific song components, like in in the audio file that you might like, or is it just like people like this band? And it's so a combination like of a well. lot of things. On Pandora, they actually hired a bunch of like undergraduate music students to listen to all kinds of music and write, like evaluate all this music on a bunch of different vectors. Mm. Um, and so they use that. That was a big project called the Music Genome Project um, that was built into Pandora. And now, of course, Pandora has all these users and they use user data as well, but it's a combination of those things. And in fact, I don't know if this is still the case on Pandora. I haven't used it for a while. Um, but there, there used to be a button you could click when it would play you something new, uh, that said something like, why did you pick this song for me? And it would say, you know, based on things that you've listened before, you seem to like, uh, female vocalists and songs with horns and what, you know, whatever, whatever qualities it has, it, it thinks you like, and, uh, that, that, that this song has. And so I thought, I always thought that was pretty interesting. Um, I don't think Spotify has anything like that. Though Spotify has now for a little while had something they call Spotify Radio, which is kind of similar to Pandora. And, and a lot of services have built in things like this to try to help with discovery. But these new features, um, 
the first one is called Follow, which is a little bit like Twitter, and you'll be able to follow uh, celebrities and and ideally, I think, also your friends on Facebook. Uh, Spotify in the U.S. is very closely hooked into Facebook. Um, and see what they're listening to and what playlists they're making. Uh, and it'll, it'll be a little bit more present, so that follow tab will be there. You'll also have a discover tab, which in this article is not super clearly explained, but it seems to kind of be a constellation of all the people that you're following, plus um, new music from artists that you've liked before and similar. So it's kind of a combination of a lot of different uh what, what they call signals in the biz. Um, and so they're kind of uh, triangulating the music that they think you're going to like based on all these signals that you've given them, including who you're following and what you've put in playlists and what music you've listened to and all kinds of things. And speaking of playlists, another new feature that they're adding, which I quite like, is called collections. You will have now a collection <laughs> that is like kind of yours though obviously you're not buying anything and the music can go away if their deal expires with the record label so it's not really yours but you can kind of save things um it w- maybe a, a better way to explain it would be it's like bookmarking an album so that you can come back to it later uh and they have had for a while playlists that you could make yourself and they found that about a third of the people that were making playlists were making a playlist of just an album because otherwise, there was no way to save an album. The only other way to get back to an album would, was to search for it again and get back to it that way. Um, and so they're now adding a, a feature where you can add albums. And you can, of course, also still make playlists that mix tracks from a bunch <coughs> of different albums. Uh, and you can still follow or subscribe to playlists. I don't, I don't know if you guys use a lot of Spotify uh, obviously, I do, and I subscribe to a lot of playlists. There's one user in particular. I have no idea who this is. His username is Ulysses Tone, and he makes some amazing playlists, like classical music used in Stanley Kubrick films. And he's like just big playlist of everything, all, all the classical music in Kubrick movies. And then yes. he's got another one of uh, closely related, Yorgi Ligeti, beginning to end. He's got another one of the uh, the Bach Verka Verschnice, the the BWV thing from number one to number five billion whatever, and it's just everything Bach ever wrote in one giant playlist. Um, Order, that's interesting. It's really cool. He does a lot of great work. Uh, he's got Fugues of the Twentieth Century as one of his playlists. Frank Zappa as a composer is one of his playlists. So he's he's got got good taste. Um, so anyway. Uh, you can still do that, and I think a lot of that stuff is going to get rolled into follow. So when I can follow this guy, I'll follow him and know when he makes a new playlist. So that'll be cool. Um, I think it's important to note that you know uh, this is not a, a you know new music in the terms that we use to describe new music can be plugged into this system as well. And plenty of the music that we've already covered on the show is. And this is just another example where it's a great discovery tool and a great sharing tool and. You know, we're figuring out how to make it pay off for artists now, but it's such a basic problem. Classical music needs to have a better metadata and be plugged into these systems in a meaningful way, you know? Mm-hmm. What's your experience, Dave? Has Spotify done anything in that realm lately? Uh, fixing metadata? No. And that's actually something I was, I was just about to get to, is nope. that the you know metadata has- for Spotify and a lot of every other, other online services still sucks. It is terrible. Yeah. I was I looking at something. I don't remember what it was last week. I think it was I was listening to like the Ludus Tonalis or something that's got like you know twenty tracks, and every track title was the same. Ludus Tonalis, Ludus mm-hmm. Tonalis, Ludus Tonalis. For I, like um, twenty tracks. Before I came to New York, I applied for a job that was posted on Craigslist. Um, and Apple? it was a com- yeah. Apple's and good. It, and it was a classical music. Um, it was someone that was very vague of what they wanted, but it was kind of like. We need a a classical music music savvy to help us update <laughs> savvy person to help us update our iTunes metadata, and I just figured like, oh my god, I want I'll move out to you know Cupertino, Cupertino. or whatever it is <laughs> and, and do that for them. That'd be so, the coolest job ever. So yeah. I never heard back about it though. Um, but no, I and that's right. They need that, more that, of that. I was guessing that that was. That was what they were going for. They like totally wanted to revamp their, you know, how they were going to handle classical music on the iTunes store. 
Well, for, and for a long time, iTunes was the only one that had it right, and they still kind of are. They're not perfect still, um, but they're they're much closer than most other places. And and the reason they are is because they actually hired people that know about classical music to do it for them. Right. Uh, and so if you're if anybody is watching this show and you know works at or has family that works at say Google in their in their Google content stuff or Spotify and their content stuff, or Amazon and their content stuff, uh, you can feel free to hire any of us to fix that for you because <laughs> it needs fixing really bad. Oh, that's right. Um, um, Dave, so what, what is that? Does any of that stuff mean anything? for? Because we've talked a lot about, and I've seen a lot of people continuing to sort of, you know, uh, bellyache on Twitter about artist payments and how that works. Does this article mm. address anything meaningful in that, or do you think that the it new kinda, features kinda, have any? Sorry, go ahead. It kind of recooks everything that we've already talked about regarding artist payments, right? But do you think any of these new features have anything to do with how that's going to work for artists? N these new features don't really have anything to do with that, and the article kind of very briefly mentioned it, um, but it kind of glossed over it. Spotify and Daniel Ek have kind of uh, been much more quiet on this legislation front than Pandora has. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's legislation in Congress right now, the Internet Radio Fairness Act, that's being debated right now, and there were hearings on it this week, but that's U.S. stuff, and this was a Guardian article about a British service, so they didn't really deal with it very much. But I don't, I don't think any of these new features are going to have a whole lot to do with that. Um, they're still, you know, Spotify and Pandora both are still paying huge sums of money to artists and they're doing it disproportionately through record labels because they have to have deals with record labels and it's very important for them to have deals with, uh, Sony and Warner and those, the big guys, but it's not very important for them to have the little guys and the little guys need them a lot more than they need the other way. So, so it's kind of, yeah. kind of still. I mean, it's debate. unfortunate for some people, but and and I see both sides. But I think it would be unfair to portray Spotify as trying to give it to the shaft to artists. No, and, and maximize ne their profits. Neither is Pandora. They just want their right. their thing to stick around for a little bit longer. So right. What are you gonna do? Um, so Dave, I think it might be time to introduce a new segment to the show. Oh, we have a new yes. segment. We we have no pick of the week this week. Are you gonna so, drop six? So I, I think we should introduce a new a new are piece. You gonna, are you dropping number six in the rundown? What was six? Dan Visconti. Oh. Oh, uh, Dan's gonna hate us now. I'm, I'm making your job even harder, Dave. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we do have another story in the rundown. If you want to skip it, we can skip it. Um, How long have we been going so far? I don't know. About half an hour. 40 minutes. Oh, that's it? 40 minutes. We can definitely talk about that. Yeah, we started a little late. Okay, sorry. I was just confused because you'd audible the the uh, order so much, Dave. We were still at number five with Spotify. So, uh, Sam, I'll let you introduce this article since you're you're the you're the person that added it to our list this week. Um, this week on New Music, uh, New Music Box, uh, Dan Visconti's blog, the title of the post is Warts and All. Um, he just recounting a, a, an, uh, an experience he had recently working in San Francisco with the chamber choir Volti, and they do um, their uh, a laboratory, what they call their choral arts laboratory. Um, the singers are all new music specialists, and they're very open to working with composers. And they did a workshop where the composers are woodshedding, sort of woodshedding pieces, and they're doing it with an audience. So the the pe the uh, concert goers get to see sort of the woodshedding process, um, which is interesting. But to me, the, the big point is why, and he, the point he makes is, why isn't this model, you know, in whatever form it takes, it doesn't have to be exactly like this, but something where the idea of workshopping a piece with a new music ensemble could be more of a community event and invite people to see it in process rather than treat it as something that's only ready to have any interaction with the community or the audience after it's reached, you know, that sounds like something uh, we've talked about before. Yeah, and it kind of goes <laughs> against, you know, uh, the, sort of the traditional, um, the traditional way a composer operates. 
you know, like you're supposed to be like have a Stockhausian sort of obsession with perfection, you know, and it's not going to be out there until I've deemed it's perfectly done and finished. And this kind of approach is not just different. I mean, it's fundamentally different in a way, you know, it's letting people in early on when things might not be <laughs> but they might hear something that you wrote that sounded kind of dumb practically speaking though like the four of us might be interested in going to hear um you know Ar- armando bajolo's workshopping of a new piece with volte but i don't think normal people give a crap like i if i'm a normal person i like no it's cool i'll wait till it's done Right. Even if I like this stuff, I, mm. I'll wait until you really mean to do the thing that you're doing. Like right well, now, like I'm not. I, does that make sense? Am I crazy? Yeah, I mean, there are sense, professional but... symphony orchestras that have open rehearsals that are not sold, <laughs> or not that they would sell them, but uh, but they're open. Know, they're they're for open like seats. horses and stuff, though, aren't they? I I think you're gonna. It's gonna be easier to get people to go to that, though. Well, here here's the idea though. Um, I mean, it's you're you're. I think that any, anybody thinking about this is automatically going to envision, you know, the way I think about workshopping a piece and what that entails, and all your. And then the only thing you're going to change is open the doors and invite people to show up. I think it suggests a more fundamental, uh, a more fundamental shift in how you think about the composition process. And I'm not saying that that's for everybody and it's going to take over, but. Um, you know, composers do special sort of special projects all the time that take them out of sort of just existing in their own brain and doing the composer thing. And, and you know, like you might collaborate with a, a, a dance troupe or something where you don't have all the material down. So I think more of it like you're collaborating with the community, which sounds, you know, hippie pie in the sky stuff. It also <laughs> doesn't sound like anything that's reasonable. Like, what do you mean collaborating with the community? Well, the the piece isn't finished, and say you have a series of three concerts where people come in the first session, and you have some material, and you workshop it, and you do projects with people who are there, and and, and you also ask re- the audience, and you have the audience fill out like a survey or something. What do you? I don't understand. Do you want me to get? I didn't. I didn't prepare a uh, unit <laughs> by unit uh, lesson plan, Dave. <laughs> I don't. Under, but I don't understand how this could possibly like. What kind of useful feedback are you going to get from the average audience member that is going to inform your composition? That's it, Dave. You've got it. You've got it. That's the question. I asked a question. That's that's the question that if you're going to do this, you have to answer. Has anybody ever told you you're a little bit crazy? (laughs) I think you might find out some interesting things from trying this process. Like what? I mean... Things you might learn from a general audience in your compositional process. But, like, what are you talking about? Like something like, like something like or something. something you like, can't just or something. The the key no. bit of what's going on here. It, it, you're like, it, it you're would gonna be get like, feedback or something, would, and like it, change no. the piece and make it better or something, and community engagement or something. Buzzwords or something. <laughs> See, I knew Dave's reaction was gonna be. I knew Dave's reaction was gonna be. Right. That's called hindsight bias. You're right, Dave. You're right, Dave. <laughs> the idea, the idea that you're going to do an artistic project centered around composition that's going to involve community participation in some local venue is not specific enough to even discuss as something that might exist. You're right. <laughs> that's completely preposterous. It's like contemplating, you know, this is fusion called, energy in a mayonnaise the jar. Game, it's completely ridiculous. A straw man. <laughs> So, that's right. right. Let's move on. Yes, well, that's what exactly I what see just is, happened. Uh, like, <laughs> I was trying to get Nate edition. to say something. What? Go ahead. <laughs> Talk. What I want to see is like the real world composer edition, or like I don't remember what it's called, but that they'd all be in their rooms. That reality uh, competition show with artists who like bring their stuff, and another one gets. Oh, oh what is that? Over. Work of art. Work of art, next great artist. Yeah, <laughs> something like that with a composer working with a chamber group or something. With with like people from See, I, I feel I, like that would I be... was thinking the same thing and then I was like, ah, oh, I don't think it could work. I, feel I don't like think that would that be show too boring. Work. Like the, I think it'd be pretty the boring. The act of making a visual thing 
works great on television. I feel like the act of making a score is really thing, bad yeah. television. <laughs> oh, there's a lot you know, of other like, kinds of composition than just making a score. And... That's like televised chess. Right. Basically. Which, Which was on happens. ESPN this week. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dave, I would say when I say I- interact with the community, the community can mean lots of things. And one big aspect of that would be local educational organizations. So if you can't imagine something that might work in that situation involving educational situations, I'll it's not my there. problem. I will, it's your I will problem. totally go with you there. Okay. I'll go with you there. I'm just playing devil's advocate and trying to get people to talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's this new segment? Sam? Yeah, Sam, you, you teased this new segment earlier, and that was a good teaser. I'm glad, I'm glad yeah. you did that. It was not an accident <laughs> at all. <laughs> that, was, that was what they call a teaser in the biz. That's right. And sorry my timing was completely gone. Uh, okay, it's time to introduce a new segment on Sound Notion. When we don't have a pick of the week, we're going to have... The Sound Notion Deep Cut... And that's that was right. that was the newly created deep cut theme song. That's right. No, no, no. That was a cut from what my suggestion this week. The the deep cut is going to be when we don't have a pick of the week. Somebody on the panel is going to suggest something that maybe they know about because it involves, in my case, like I played clarinet in school. So I, I know about this piece, which is Stravinsky Three Pieces for Solo Clarinet. It's an awesome piece. Um he wrote it just a little bit before the time that he wrote Soldier's Tale, and it was, uh, you know, it was really just a, a money-making endeavor for him. He wrote it for I can't remember the guys, but some he wrote it as a thank you gift, <laughs> thank you gift to some, you know, socialite, um, amateur player, which is amazing. So anyway, Stravinsky three pieces for solo, solo clarinet. It's a great piece, and that's the Sound Notion deep cut. And that's this week's deep cut, and that's this week's Sound Notion. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody that was joining us in chat room. We, if you're uh, watching this after the fact and you'd like to watch live sometime we do the show every sunday morning at 11 a.m eastern time and you can do the math for your uh time zone uh if you're in the southern hemisphere you're gonna have problems because we are now on daylight time whereas you are no we're on standard time and you're on daylight time have you ever tried to coordinate with somebody in the southern hemisphere there like is. It's, a, it's a two hour swing when the clock changes because we change one direction and they change the other direction um, that's not important. You should watch us at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Soundnotion.tv slash live. Join us in chat, and you can yell at us live while we're still doing the show. And I think that's way more fun than yelling at us after the fact, which you can still do on our site, soundnotion.tv slash sn. We also have links to all the stories that we talked about there and all the music that we talked about this week. Uh, you can also catch up with us on Facebook or Twitter. We're at Sound Notion as a group on Twitter. I'm at Dave McDow. Sam is at Housegoy. Patrick is at Vox Shibuya. It's been so long, I almost forgot. And I Nate know. is at Anate Tree. Yes. Anate Tree. Anate Tree. At a Nate tree. Yes. That's Nate's tree impression. Right? <laughs> uh, this is he's doing good work there. Do, do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if you'd like to support our show, you can do that um, by using our Amazon affiliate search box on the right side of our site, soundnotion.tv, and buy your Christmas gifts by typing in there and searching for things and buying them that way, and we get a tiny little commission from that. Um, we are going to be taking a couple weeks off for Christmas slash New Year, as we did last year. And during that time, I will be cutting together a best of 2012 Sound Notion show to put up in the feed for you all to watch. So if you have any suggestions for anything that you saw this year on the show that you think uh, is, is worthy of the title, Best of Sound Notion 2012, <laughs> uh, send us a note. You can, you can do that on our site, soundnotiontv at gmail.com. You can get, catch us on Twitter or Facebook, whatever. Uh, we'll, and we will be having an episode next week, though. We, we do have one more episode, and then after that, we're, we're taking two weeks off. Thank you for, for pointing that out, Patrick. Um, <clears throat> Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching. 
We'll see you back next week.